No, I'm going to go live now. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Eric Murphy. Eric, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be great every day. Eric is a former U.S. Army officer who served for 13 years, to include nine years on active duty as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. While serving, he saw operational deployments to both Afghanistan and Europe. He is currently a business development manager at Pittsburgh Data in Seattle. Pittsburgh Data is a leading financial data software provider for the private capital markets and a sub subsidiary of Morningstar, which I did not know that. In his work with Pittsburgh, Eric helps a diverse set of clients apply and integrate meaningful insights into emerging capital markets. His clients range from large investment banks, private equity groups, and venture capitalists to PC startups and sole consultants. Eric also mentors service members and transition through veterinary as an advocate for veterans to pursue careers in tech and finance, specifically tech sales. He is currently working to promote veteran hiring in tech, helping service members bridge the gap to roles in the tech world. Eric currently lives in Bremerton, Washington with his wife, Megan, and their two children. He has a bachelor's in geography from the United States Military Academy at West Point and was rated a pilot in command in the UH-60M and HH-60M during his time in service. Eric, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Jason. Thanks for having me. Glad we were able to uh, finally set this up. We've been talking about doing this for six months or so now. So excited to uh, do this and be able to do it in person too. Yes. Now, first, I, you know, as you can see, I'm in a new podcast space here and I want to thank uh, WeWork and uh, Bunker Labs for giving me the space. As many of you know who follow me, I, 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 I volunteer on Bunker Labs. At Bunker Labs, we help uh, military veterans on entrepreneurial journey, which me and Eric talk more about, talk more about that later. Um, but I just want to thank for the great space here. And also um, at Cameron HR, we're doing our, uh, we're about to release our MVP at the end of the month, and we're signing up people for our wait list. So you ever come to 49 or fewer people, we, we encourage you to sign up for our wait list. We have a lot of perks for you. And to go to the wait list, you can go to www.cabinetshr.com. So Eric, um, you have a lot going on. I mean, startup world is like thriving right now. I mean, like we talked in the pre-talk how like, you know, the news didn't do a good job, but like, you know, of course, restaurants, hotels, you know, that suffered, but a lot of companies are hiring, especially tech startups. Can you talk about that, that just a little bit? Yeah, I think it's an exciting time to be in the tech world. Um, over the last year, of course, a lot of turbulence, a lot of craziness. Uh, if you asked me that this time last year, I might not have had such a rosy outlook. However, there are companies, uh, you know, that kept hiring throughout the entire entirety of the pandemic. Pitchbook, for instance, I think we stopped hiring for about a month as we figured ourselves out. Uh, and then we were right away in, in May or June with remote uh, onboarding classes. So, yeah, there, there are tons of jobs out there. It's a great time to be looking for work in the tech field, especially if you're a veteran. Um, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to help out with uh, right now in the greater Seattle area. Um, and, yeah, it's just a great time to be getting into tech. Uh, as there's a lot of a lot of startups raising money, a lot of capital being deployed, uh, and, a, and a lot of growth. Also, geographical growth. You know, going outside just the the norms of the Bay Area, Boston, New York, Seattle. There's you know startups in in Iowa, in Houston. So it's there's there's a lot of geographical growth as well uh, beyond kind of the traditional tech hubs. Um, so yeah, it's just an exciting time to be in in the tech world. So Eric, going back to your background, you graduated from West Point, correct? That's correct. Back in 2011. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't think many people know how exactly how competitive West Point and service academies are, right? It's very competitive, right? Don't you have to be like nominated by a U.S. senator or congressman or something like that? Yeah, it, it, it's competitive. There's a uh, physical test. There's, yeah, like you said, nomination from a congress uh, congressperson, be it a senator or a representative. Um, so, yeah, and you have to go do interviews for that. It's, it's hyper competitive. Um, academic tests, of course, the SAT, ACTs, um, and then just the standard application type things, essays, questions. So pretty competitive. Uh, I think the acceptance rate is somewhere around, you know, between 10 or 12%. So it's, it's competitive to get there. And then once, once you get there, like the competition has only started, you're now, you know, sitting with the top, you know, everyone was valedictorian at their high school. Everyone was captain of the. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing team. there's no dummies at West Point. No, well, I mean, I got through there, so there, <laughs> there, there was at least one. But um, no, it, it, it and just to be surrounded by that that high level of of excellence in everything people do and, and 
you know, physical, military, academic world. It's 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 exciting to be there. And yeah, it was it was it was tough as hell, but I will go back and do it again. It was it was so fun. so. Why West Point? What drew you to drew you to compete for West Point versus like University of Texas or some other school or USC, Stanford, Notre Dame? Why why West Point? Yeah, I, I looked at a few schools. You know, I, I looked at uh, the other academies as well. Looked at um, some civilian schools. Considered just doing doing the ROTC route, but uh, went and did a visit at West Point. Had a, a high school mentor who you know who recommended I go. He said you got to go. You got to go there and feel. You know, if it feels right, you're you're gonna know. And I, w- I went there, did a visit, did an overnight visit, and just the energy at that place, the, the the people there, it was it was exciting to be there, and and it just felt right. Um, so, yeah, I, I got the nomination and, and 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 accepted it pretty much right away, and and here we are. So, you you did like 13 years in the military, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I was in for a minute. So, question is like most people say, like me, I got 13 years, I'm gonna do my 20, right? And that's and especially in the military. People say, "Why are you gonna get out thirteen? But you're wasting all this retirement." What drove you like to get out, so to speak, and that pursue your civilian career? Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, it, it was just stability for my family. I mean, uh, signed up to you know, and, and part I guess the reason to go to West Point as well is you know, serving the country. Uh, was able to, to do that. Deployed to Afghanistan. Um, d- did my part there in in the, the war on terror. So, kind of felt like I had, I had accomplished what I, I set out to do with that. And then wanted to have, you know, put down some roots, get some stability for my family. And uh, my wife wanted to get back to work as well. We kind of moved around a lot in the military. It, it's, it's hard for military spouses. It's so hard. It's, and, and like, they're some of the most intelligent, like the brightest minds I know are military spouses. So that's another thing is helping military spouses in tech. How can we help some of the spouses at JBLN or at Naval Base Kitsap get into tech in Seattle? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's something I'm, I'm hoping to work more on as well here in the coming months, coming year. So yeah, for my wife, get, get, get set up somewhere where she could have more of a career and, and have our kids set in a place to grow up, uh, kind of drove the decision and, and it kind of worked out that she got a job at a startup here in town and made the move back out here. Yeah. For those who might not know this, military spouses are the highest unemployment demographic, any other demographic. It's like 20, 25, sometimes 30 percent. And I'm, I'm trying to mix the number up, like 70, 80% of military spouses have bachelor's degrees, right? Yeah. But like no one takes a chance to, them, oh, you know, Mrs. Cabinet, so you're going to move in two years, why should I hire you, right? Not, and they don't think, well, I'll have this great asset for two years, right, at least, right? And they don't think it like that, you know, fortunately. Well, and I, and I think the underemployment is a big part of it too, where maybe you can get a job, but it's not within your degree or, you know, again, you're going to have to move and start over. That was the problem my wife ran into was she had to move and start over at the bottom again. No one wanted to, you know, hire her laterally. So it's it's really really frustrating, and um, I'm happy she's she's now with with DocuSign here in town, is loving it. So I mean, just seeing her happy every day and fulfilled in her job. So best so example much. I have like underemployment. I, I did my campaign man time in Vicenza, Italy, right? Every bagger was a spouse. Everyone had a had a master's degree. So yeah. I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah. All y'all have master's degrees. You're bagging groceries, like. This nuts. I mean, it's overseas and all. I get it, but it still is like, man, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And and, and military people that I mean, they have a lot of they can learn too. You know. Um. So next, talk about you do a lot of volunteer work. Next, talk about you work with team. I think it's called Team Red, Red, White, and Blue. Is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Team Red, White, and Blue. Team RWB. Um. Honestly, has taken a little bit of a pause with the, with the pandemic. Um. And and that organization is awesome. It, it's all about. Um, connecting veterans, civilians. It doesn't, doesn't matter who you are, but it, it's about getting people out, getting, um, and, and doing it through exercise. So uh, I, I helped set up a chapter of Fort Rucker, Alabama here at, at JBLM during my time in service. Um, and then was able to, you know, participate in some of their bigger events. Uh, like I did the, uh, the rag ride, bike ride across Iowa, which was pretty awesome. And, and it's just this cool group, you know, it was, you know, a mix of veterans of people that had never served and you just get to go connect for a week and ride bikes and eat pork chops on the side of the road and <laughs> drink beer and hang out. It, it was an amazing experience and everyone kind of walked away with it with a better appreciation. So do you know other. Chris Smith? Uh, not, not familiar with Chris. Okay. He's part of, he's part of it too here in Seattle. I okay. connected with him. He does uh, his company. He does consulting. 
basically, you know how the military like do patrol, patrol bases. Mm-hmm. He takes big level CEOs and takes them patrol bases in Montana. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so you know, I, I got to connect with him. So next, another thing you spend a lot of time with this. I think it's called Veterari. Hope I'm putting down that right. Yeah, uh, Veterati. So in in the process of myself getting out, you know, I, I sought some mentorship in people that had done it, um, and, and most of the people that I, I sought counsel from were kind of later on in their career had, you know, had success as I was, you know, looking to, to find a job. And, and I kind of saw a gap where I, 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 at least me personally, didn't connect with anyone that had kind of just gone through the transition. So I guess I'm, you know, a few, I got two years out now. So I'm kind of coming out of that window of being fresh, but I said, I, I, I want to, I just went through this. I want to help folks that uh, are going through it now. Cause I know, you know, it's different than it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago, or even two years ago. So yeah, I decided to go on uh, as a mentor with them. I talk with a few, a few veterans a month or a few people in transition a month. Then it's awesome to hear just the people looking to transition a, a lot of them into tech because they can kind of see, Hey, this guy's in tech. He works in the, um, you know, in, in the tech sales industry, working with venture capital, private equity. Um, so yeah, I just talk to people in transition and, and kind of help, help talk to them about the pitfalls I fell into um, how, you know, success I had with translating experience and, um, yeah, it, it, success interviewing as a, as a veteran, because it, especially with, you know, a lot, not a lot of tech companies, I guess some do, you know, have that, that veterans program. So there are a lot of great smaller tech companies out there that don't, and you have to kind of explain yourself. You have to, you know, know what to say to translate it into tech speak. That, that makes sense for, for them. Yeah, I definitely want to do a deeper dive in your, your process from going from the Army to your Pittsburgh job and how that worked. But back to nonprofits, we talked about this some in, during our pre-talk. There are so many nonprofits like, that say that, you know, they help veterans, right? Mm-hmm. Some are good, but some are like, what are you doing, right? Like, example I gave was like three nonprofits in Fort Lewis who take veterans deep sea diving. Like, is there really a need for three nonprofits to take people deep sea diving? Maybe there is, I don't know, right? Yeah. But if you're a veteran getting out, what advice you have a veteran, like, you no, know, no, pick a a nonprofit is going to help you that's actually going to help you and not like, you know, in it for ulterior motives, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd say do your research, talk to other, other veterans, see what's out there. I think, I think all, all of them have, the, you know, good intentions in mind. Like you said, maybe there is room for some consolidation because um, there, there are a lot out there and there's a huge need. Um, the one probably piece of advice I'd have there is, you know, as you're in transition, getting out, like get involved with something. Um that's kind of one of the, you know, I, I haven't done as much with Team RWB because of the pandemic. I haven't uh, gotten out and done a lot of that stuff because of all of this. Now coming out, I'm excited to get out and do some of those events, do some, maybe some camping in Montana. Now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, just do something, get involved. Don't just, uh, don't just sit at the house and, you know, be miserable and, and, you know, because you're not finding a job because it's tough. Um, yeah. Get out, do something, meet people. Yeah, you bring yeah. a good point. Like in the military, we're in such a bubble, right? Like if you're at Fort Hood, you're probably not going to all go to Austin. Let's go to Sixth Street. Yeah. If you're in Fort Lewis, you're not going to Seattle, right? Talk about the points like when people in the military get out of the bubble and go on the network and stuff, meeting people, right? Yeah. And another thing to say to you, like when I was when I was getting out, when I retired, I'd get out. I would go like a like a military job fair. I was like, everyone here's in the military. How they can help me get a job, right? So I started going like meet us if I was the only military veteran, yeah. right? And just talk about the points of doing that. Yeah, I, I I think that that's how I found success, and that's honestly how I how I landed a, a role at PitchBook was uh, kind of keeping my ear to the ground of of the Seattle tech scene. Was lucky to be out here, you know, I was stationed at Fort Hood at the time, but I was able to come here and do the hiring our heroes program. Uh, big shout out to Rob Comer with with HOH. Here. Yeah, Rob Comer's a great guy. I love I Rob. Know him. I love Rob. He's, he's a great guy. Shout out to Rob. Yeah, he he really helped me out. I had a tight timeline. Um, yeah. He, 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 he saved me and uh, got me out here from Fort Lewis, uh, got me into an internship. Uh, but really the value there was just being able to be here. Of course, this is, this is pre COVID. Uh, so hopefully we're getting back to more of this, but I was able to go to networking events that, you know, there were no other veterans there unless I, you know, brought, uh, brought Bernard. So <laughs> shout out to Bernard. Um, but yes, it get out there, go out of your comfort zone. I, you know, I hear, here I met some cool tech thing in, in, you know, pioneer square, and I, and I met people from PitchBook and talked to them. They were so amped about the company. I said, I, I got to learn more about, about this, this company. I, I, I got to find out more about them. And that's a place I want to go work. Um, so I wouldn't have found that had I not been on, you know, 
keep my ear to the ground on on the tech stuff in Seattle and kind of going outside of my comfort zone, driving up to, to Seattle to go to these events. Um, because yeah, th- there are some great like veteran siring events, but uh, especially you know, coming up here to Seattle, like you need to go to the ones that aren't just for veterans. Yeah, you got to go where the only, you only, you only, whatever you are, you know, a new college student, or the immigrant, whatever you are, you should try to be the only person in the room, right? That way you just, you know, because yeah. I, I would go to job fairs down in Fort Lewis, like, you know, go to events, but like everyone's like, a, it's like USA or financial advisors selling, you know, trying to, you know, it's like, what am I doing here, right? Where, yeah. And like, no matter if you got a full hood or full brag, it's going to take maybe an hour to you got to go, but it's the work, investment of time and like the networking, you just got to do it right. Yep. And the sooner, and of course, you know, in the military, you're working at five in the morning, you really have time, probably not, but I mean, you got to find time. Yeah. And I think that's important when you're in that transition time is to make time for yourself. Um, and I think the army and the military is getting a lot better at letting they, they people do that. So bad. But yeah, I, I mean, horrible stories on that. It, it's so hard to unplug from that, that military job. Um, but you got to do it because, Hey, there's a, a date that you're leaving. Well, first of all, it's, 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 it's a man back Congress says you got to do it right. So right. that's well, the first yeah. thing, right? Yeah. That's important too. You know, yeah, that's Congress said we got to do this. Yeah. <laughs> but two horror stories I got one. Well, one one story not really a horror story. I was going through transition with like old football colonel star major, and they both stayed in front of the group. I didn't realize how important this was. I would have done a better job making sure my people went to this right, right. And like they didn't know. Another story is like I was doing the transition stuff. Had an E four in there. E five came. Hey, specialist, whatever his name was. You supposed to be the range. I started. I get out in two weeks. My job was to make sure you're training for war. You coming with me, right? And like, what could anyone do? Like nothing, right? Yeah. Because the commander's program. It's, there's so many bad stories like that. Yeah, I, I had a good story in in my H, uh, my higher heroes group. We had a, a squadron commander, and you know some of the folks in the program knew him as a squadron commander, and they said he was the guy that always made sure his his uh, his team was being able to take advantage of programs like you know any of the CSP internships. And they said it's so refreshing to see him now here doing this, and that what a standard that sets. You know, after he leaves. Um, but they're like, yeah, he he made sure other people were able to take advantage of it. So they they were so thankful that he was able to get to, you know, experience that as well. So let's, let's talk about your journey from going to being a U.S. Army officer to Pittsburgh, right? Your yeah. helicopter pilot. Yeah. I mean, there's really no straight path to that, right? It's like, like we can do a fly, fly you know, a private helicopter from Pittsburgh. Like, how do you sell them your skills, convince them that you are matched for this position? Well, I, I've told the CEO if he decides to purchase a Pittsburgh helicopter, I will fly it for him. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that's still a long way off. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was, you know, and, and going into, into sales is tough too, because, you know, sales, there's kind of a defined pipeline. You start as a, um, you know, as like the sales development representative role, pounding the phones, making calls, booking meetings for, for the senior reps. And I kind of came in, in, in the middle of that at, at, at the, uh, you know, the, the, the closing role. So Pitchbook kind of took a chance on me, honestly. They they saw some intangibles that they they liked. They said we can teach them teach them how to do sales. Um, so they took a chance on me. And 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 the way I got there was translating my resume well. That kind of set the foundation. I think if I had had you know a, mil- a five page military jargon resume from uh, SFL with, with, tab with, with twenty thousand acronyms, pass. Then yeah, you know, they never would have even gotten past the header. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time, I had a hundred people look at my resume, you know, military, civilian. And I, I, I made a pact with myself that I would update that, you know, like every week. And so it was always, always evolving and always getting better. And, and I, and I got to the point where I had a really well translated resume where someone in the civilian world could look at it and say, oh, okay, I have an idea what this person did. Um, and a person in the military would look at it and say, okay, I, I know what this guy did exactly. Um, so that was kind of step one. And then I, you know, at least at, at PitchBook, most, most tech companies are, are somewhat similar phone screen with HR first, and then you go on to a, you know, the hiring manager interview. So had the phone screen with HR, um, that went well. And, and honestly, it was, I, I knew a bit about the company. I didn't know everything. I, and that's I, a good point. <laughs> if you're going for a job, do some kind of minimal research on company, yeah. right? Like go on LinkedIn, go somewhere and, and you know, the last thing you want to do is ask you, what, what's our company values? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. What's on our website, dude? Like, what are you doing? And a uh, pitch book, the values are super important. Like, they're on the wall. I mean, it's, it, it, we live and breathe them. So it's 
it, it's not just you know some some jargon on the website or on on the the t shirt. Um, and 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 with that, yeah, go go if it's a publicly traded company, go read the ten Ks, ten Qs, go read their quarterly reports because there's gold in there. Um, I, I interviewed another Seattle company that uh, you know I won't mention. I, I did some research on that and and saw hey this this sales unit isn't doing well and is is kind of going away. So, you know, decided not to to pursue that opportunity. But there there's some gold out there if if you do some digging and and you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the company that's giving you their time to to read up on them. So another thing we were talking about in our pre-talk too, a lot of veterans were taught, you know, my team did this, my team did this. But the serial world, they want to know what you did. Yeah. How did you make the transition from like you no know, being a team player, quote unquote, and like almost like bragging to yourself, bragging to yourself? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's hard because we're so ingrained with that. This is team. I, you know, I just facilitated my team being successful. Um I'll say, you know, when you're in transition and 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 you you get to that point where you're saying, Well, I, I need to say I did these things. You're not taking anything away from the team. The the team still did that together, but you know, don't be afraid to take ownership of that because you were a big part of that. So, um, I mean, don't say you did anything you didn't do, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, that's what's expected because you did do those things. It's just kind of a, a shift of the lexicon. You know, it's, it's, you, you did those things that that's how the civilian world sees it. Don't be afraid to take ownership of that. Yeah. So back, back to your military career, what is a pilot in command? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, was lucky to come out here to Fort Lewis. Um, got to flew Blackhawks. Got to go to Afghanistan. Um, yeah, I was able to take my pilot in command check ride before I left here and and got signed off on that. So I could, you know, the pilot in command is the person who's responsible for the helicopter. So the two pilots in every Army helicopter, and um, it's kind of the the pilot and the pilot in command, and then that pilot in command is responsible for that aircraft. So anything that happens, and it's a rigorous testing process to say the least when I went through, you know, every unit's a little different, but when I went through, it was uh, about a week of oral evaluations, flight evaluations. Um, they just kind of set me in a room and said, Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll come get you in a bit. And would come in and just barrage me with, with oral evaluation on what the Black Hawk does. You know, you gotta know all the different um, engine temperatures and emergency procedures. Cause you just have to know that stuff when, when an emergency happens. And then, you go out and you fly in, in the instruments in the clouds, you fly a tactical mission, you fly just a performance evaluation. So it was a incredibly hands-on process. Uh, took, took a week to do it and was able to complete that before I left Fort Lewis uh, and then get signed off again at, at Fort Hood and flew as a uh, pilot in command for a little bit with the medevac unit there. And then went over to the, uh, to the assault battalion and flew the regular Blackhawks again. Now, how does one become a helicopter pilot? I know you go to aviation school for a rucker. Like, mm-hmm. what's the process? I mean, at West Point, you, you pick your branches. They pick you. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, it's changed a little bit since I went through um, on the West Point side, but it's a little bit more of a interview type process. When I went through, it was kind of more just, what's your class rank? Uh, are, are you high enough? <laughs> um, but now it's, I, I think it's a little bit more uh, finding the right fit for people. So, yes, yeah, so selecting it out of ROTC or... Uh, or West Point. The other the other path is the path of the warrant officer, which um, is a great path for either you know enlisted soldiers. Enlisted also could do kind of the green to gold, and fly as an officer, or they could uh, go the the warrant officer route, and warrant officers fly fly a good bit more. So uh, that's that's a great route to go. And I mean they're the, they're the technical tactical experts in the helicopter, so they they fly more. Um, they're the ones that are primarily the the instructor pilots, the maintenance pilots. Uh, and, and that's who I got to lead, which was awesome. Uh, the the pilots and then also the, the crew chief maintainers. So um, just just a high caliber of people. But yeah, so you either go the, the officer route or the warrant officer route. Um, there are options to come in straight from the civilian world to go to warrant officer school. And, you know, one, one day you're a civilian and, you know, six months, a year later, you're a warrant officer flying helicopters. So what was the last time you flew? Oh gosh, like two years ago now, years ago. a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. You, you were planning to fly again or? Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I kind of had planned to go do some fixed wing certifications and, and do some more flying that way, get back up on my rotary certifications. But uh, COVID kind of put a wrench in that. And then now uh, just bought a house. So that's kind of more, uh, more pressing uh, than going to joyride uh, in the skies. But yeah, absolutely. I, lo- I love flying and 
mean, I, I absolutely miss that about the military getting to go. So, so for those of you who listen to this, and you, I'm sure you're going to look at Eric's profile later on. On Eric's LinkedIn profile, he has the picture of a Kraken, the Seattle's new hockey team. Oh, yeah. So hockey, you talk, I mean, Eric, talk about your love of hockey, how you got involved with that, and, and how Pittsburgh's going to be involved with the Kraken. Yeah, super, super excited about this. So I, I grew up Western New York, Buffalo Sabres fan. Um, which is, you know, has its, its highs and its lows, mostly lows, uh, at least recently, but love hockey. Um, you know, we had a, a minor league team in my hometown. So love going to those games as well. Um, was very excited right when we were moving back out here was when they announced that Seattle got the, the next franchise. And now it's like so close. It's like the draft is in a couple of weeks, uh, the season, you know, a couple of months, um, got on with pitch book. It, it's a super exciting place to be. It is a, you know, massively growing organization. And, and kind of one of the things we said was, or not we said, uh, but the, the marketing partnerships team said was, you know, we need to, to, to get our name out there and, and make a move, make a wave, I guess. <laughs> and so they last summer announced that we're one of the founding sponsors of uh, the Seattle Kraken. So it is going to be at the Climate Pledge Arena. It's going to be the, the pitch book suites. Oh, wow. And, and we're their financial data provider. So, so uh, hooking the team up with some pitch book access as well. And then also some interactive pitch book experience in the suites themselves. So if, if you, uh, if, if you get to a suite at a pitch book game or at a, at a cracking game, you'll probably see some, some pitch book uh, in the suite. And where are they playing at again? The hockey team, the hockey team at the climate pledge arena, the old, the old key arena. Oh, cause they're playing the key arena. Yeah. Is that, is that like a long-term plan to stay there or are they going to build an arena for them or yeah, something? So or? Yeah. That, that place is is totally re- like totally renovated. They, okay, I, I, I've been there like maybe six seven years ago. I went to a WNBA game. It was like okay, yeah. like you know this thing's updated. Yeah, I, I went. Yeah, when I was stationed here at Fort Lewis, we went to a few concerts there and, and some WNBA games. And um, yeah, I definitely needed a, a a a refurbish. And it, I went out there a couple months ago with the family just to go walk around the Space Needle and mm-hmm. and get some outside time. And it is yeah, they took it down to the bones. And it looks amazing. If, if you look at any of their social media, um, that place is going to be a sweet place to catch a hockey game. Nice. I and mean, hopefully an a NBA game too. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be so, probably already sold out for years ahead of time already, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, that's kind of why I'm glad that, that PitchBook sponsored them. Hopefully, you know, I can get some, some tickets through, <laughs> through work. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're, they're going to be sold out for a while. So next, let's talk about something else you have a love for and the love for bourbon. I do love bourbon. Talk about how you got got involved with that. Like, what when you start drinking, how, how do you get, get involved? Like, you know, become an expert, so to speak. I wouldn't say an expert. Uh, I dabble. I started drinking at twenty one, and um, yeah, I don't know. Just um, you know, I, I think bourbon is is pretty prevalent in in the military. There's mm-hmm. a lot of guys that love bourbon. Um, so c- kind of got into it from there. The thing I like about bourbon is you can get a, a great bottle of bourbon for thirty bucks. Yeah, you know, it's. I love scotch too, but a great bottle of scotch, you're starting at, you know, yeah. 60, I never got the bucks. taste of scotch. I always, I never, I mean, I like it, but it's not, not like a bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it, but it's I, bourbons, bourbons where, where it's at for me. You can go get a, a great bottle for 20, 30 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, started, you know, kind of flight school down there in the South. And then, um, you know, obviously a, a lot of good bourbon down there in Alabama, um, right by Kentucky and Tennessee. So, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of started enjoying it there and have, so here's a question for you. When did you go from like, not saying Jack Daniels bad, Jack Daniels a good startup bourbon, but when did you go from like, Hey, Jack Daniels, like to something else, right? Probably after flight school. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I mean, flight school, it was a great time. It was, uh, you know, a bunch of guys living in a house drinking Jack Daniels but, uh, and, and studying a lot of studying. Um, yeah. Probably when I got out here to Fort Lewis and then went back to Fort Rucker after that, um, got into just tasting stuff to taste it and, and enjoying more of that. So, um, so yeah. two, two part question, like what's your go-to bourbon you're saying and how often like, you do try new bourbons? Um, my go-to right now is, is, is that four roses I told you okay. about. That's a great bourbon. It's, um, you can get a great bottle of four roses for, for 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. You can step up to like the single barrel for, you know, a, a little bit more. Um, or, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love Elijah Craig as well. Yeah. That's like a $26 bottle and it is delicious. Um, try new bourbons. I, I, you know, I haven't done a ton of that recently, um, but I, I guess I actually just tried a new one last night. So, <laughs> but yeah, you know, every, every couple months I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll grab a new bottle at, 
at Total Wine or something and um and and try something new. Cool. Next, um, can you talk about how you help uh, promote veteran hiring and tech and sales and, and from veterans and military spouses? Yeah, so uh, you know, partially through that work with with Veterati, um, kind of also just through the network and 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 trying to talk to people and and um, help them through the transition. And, and I guess I've recently kind of looked at it as, as as twofold. You know, how can I help veterans in trans in transition? And then on, on the other hand, how can I help tech companies because the tech companies are missing out so much great talent. There's there's a ton, and and the and the larger players, you know, Amazon has a dedicated military, you know, recruiting team, but but some of the smaller, you know, companies, it's just you know, there's there's no ability to have that kind of a dedicated team. There's just the, the size doesn't um, doesn't allow for it. But I but I think a lot of veterans would love to be at a smaller tech company and, and because the impact you can make, right? Huge impact. So PitchBook. Uh, and, and don't quote me, I, I forget what we're at today because we literally hire people all the time. I, I think we're somewhere between 15 and 1700 people. I think we'll be at close to 2000 by the end of the year. Um, I think we hired 400 people throughout COVID. So it's like, we're growing like crazy. Um, but it still feels like that's kind of small family feel. It feels like a, a battalion or a brigade, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. it feels like that. You kind of know everybody, you at least know somebody in every unit. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I, I think a lot of people love working in Amazon as well, but you, it, it's just a very different dynamic at a, at a company that big uh, or, you know, at a Microsoft. So, and, and, I, and I think people don't know about the smaller tech companies in the world, you know, the. Um, yeah, like, like how many military veterans know to go to AngelList, right? Yeah. And look for a startup. Like I tell people AngelList is like, for you to know AngelList is angellist.co, not Angie, but AngelList. Right. That go is based like the LinkedIn for startups, right? Mm-hmm. Start people post jobs on there. People raise funds. It's another great place to find a job. Yeah, where I had success, uh, and I'll absolutely plug this organization. Um, built in Seattle, uh, it's a like tech website. They'll have job postings. They do um, highlight stories on companies in town, and they they host events. So that the event that I met people from PitchBook at was at a built in Seattle event, um, and and they have one for most of the kind of the tech hubs. There's a built in San Francisco, Austin, Boston, New York, Colorado. So there's, there's kind of one for all the main tech hubs. And if you're looking to kind of get into that space, it's a great way to just kind of know who the players are. Um, subscribe to newsletters. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot you can do that isn't a huge lift. It's just kind of learning and checking stuff out on the internet and then eventually going to, going to some events. So, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's not just going to fall in your lap, you no. know. You got to go, you got to go out and find it. So two part question from what you observe is seeing what are military veterans getting wrong about trying to get tech jobs? And then what are tech companies getting wrong by bringing on military talent? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think the main thing veterans are, are missing out on is those smaller tech companies and they just don't know about them. And, you know, also kind of what we talked about earlier where, you know, just, Hey, I, I, I threw my resume out to every job on Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft. Yeah. And, Amazon has hundred jobs. And, I and applied they, every single job on Amazon. And they didn't call me back. Um, I mean, there are ways to break into big companies like that. And it's more of a, you know, I, I always tell people ne- don't stop applying. There are people that will tell you, don't, don't, don't apply, just network your way in. Keep applying. Cause I got into pitch book on a cold apply. It, it, it works there. You know, it's, it's a low percentage, but it works. Um, but you also have to understand for those bigger companies, it's not a person, you know, looking at your resume. It's probably a, um, you know, a, a computer system. How can you get through that? There's some optimization, you know, that you can do with the resume to, to get through that. But then also it is the human touch, the networking, get to know the military recruiting team at Amazon or Microsoft. Um, get to know those smaller tech companies where a person will look, look at your profile because they're going to get, you know, 10 or 15 applications for a job instead of, 500. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of a blended approach that I always recommend to people of, Hey, keep applying places and and also do that personal touch, you know, reach out. Don't be afraid to send a LinkedIn message to the recruiting team at Amazon. They're going to love it. Like we said, and do something different. Like maybe, you know, they get 10,000 emails, maybe you send them a, find their Instagram and send them an Instagram DM, or maybe yeah. you send a tweet or, yeah. you know, something stand like out different. somehow, go, go to that event and, you know, get to know them and then follow and then follow up following up is huge and say, Hey, I met you at this event. Love what you had to say about, 
um, about the company would love to talk more and, you know, make, make an informational interview, something. Um, but it is, I mean, it's a full-time job to get a job. So <laughs> no doubt. And, and, and that's where it goes back to, you know, taking time for yourself in transition to, to be successful and take care of yourself and your family. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, and I would say on the company side, I think, um, I, I think there's just, there's so such a great pool of veteran talent that a lot of companies don't know about. And it, it's kind of one of those, you just don't know about it because you don't know about it. And it's, you don't know about it because it's hard and it's hard to translate veteran resumes sometimes, but the, you know, you think of all the brilliant people we worked with in, in the army, in any of the services, um, there's a ton of talent and technical talent too. Like people that can learn a computer system pretty quickly can learn to, um, you know, talk technically about something on a sales call can aren't afraid to pound the phone and make sale. Like <laughs> military people are so dedicated and so enthusiastic and go getters that, um, I, I think a lot of times they don't check the right boxes. So they'll fall by the wayside on some of those interviews or, you know, get screened out. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of great organizations out there that are, that are helping, um, companies get through that. And I, I think a lot of it just comes from having a veteran or veterans at the company, you know, taking a chance on, on somebody and then building that program out because there's a lot of good talent out there. So Eric, let's, let's talk about fundraising, but a different aspect, right? We'll talk, we'll talk about startups raising funds in a minute, but I mean, I could be wrong, but I think, I don't think a lot of startup founders realize how hard it is for VCs to raise money, right? I think yeah. a lot of startup founders, I thought this in like, John Brown, the VC has $10 million. I got, and if it's my job, give it to right. No, John Brown has to go to other people and know, I won't say big for money, but I don't big for money, right? Yeah. And I would think it's harder for them because like I, I'm getting money from people like $100 million fund. They have to find people with billions of dollars and convince them, you know, and this has to be a really small pool. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah. And, that, and that's, and one of the reasons I chose PitchBook was they had such a great training program and it was immersion in this space that like, for, you know, I mentioned, learning about the company, I, you know, I, I Googled what is PE and VC <laughs> for my interview. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with and that. that. Was, and that was a question. And, and, and I got it right. Wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. And, but they said, hey, that's cool. That's all you need to know. We'll teach you everything else. And they, and they did. It's a two-week pitch book university to work there and everyone goes through it. So you know, what does an investment bank do? What is a series A versus series B versus seed? Um, so I, I, I love that because I had no clue. I didn't know, but they were, you know, again, we're willing to take a chance, willing to train me. Um, and, and so, you know, now I, I mentioned, yeah, I'm working more, more with the investors, more with the larger, I still work with some startups, but um, it's hard out there for, for VCs to raise that money. They have to go, um, you know, they'll, they'll raise a fund. And like you said, it, it is a, you know, maybe a 10, 20, 50, hundred million dollar fund that they're then going to invest in five, 10, 20 startups. And, you know, of course, a VC is a little bit more high risk. So yeah, maybe a, a couple of those work out, great exit, and you know th th they make returns for their their partners. And those partners are the big what we call in institutional investors or, or limited partners. And they are think like pensions, endowments, universities, foundations, um, anybody with a lot of money. Like you said billions and billions of dollars and, and lots of money, lots of money they can afford to, you know, lose. Yeah. And, 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 and they're diversifying their risk. They have, they have a public equities profile. They have a private equity, they have a venture capital real estate. So, uh, and, and that's what we call them limited partners because there's limited risk. Um, that, that, that's one of the reasons. So um, they're going out there to these LPs and they're doing the same thing startup founders are doing. They're saying, Hey, this is me. I'm Jason. I'm raising this hundred million dollar fund. And this is my thesis. This is why I'm going to be successful. Um, and they're going through the, through the ringer with it, with, you know, just like startup founders are to, to raise that fund. And then that's why they put startup founders through the ringer as well, because yeah. they have to be good, you know, fiduciary stewards of that, of that. Because it's not their money. It's some other person's money. Yeah. yeah playing with other, other people's money. They can, oh, I like drinking beer with you and I like your product idea. Here's like $10 million. Yeah. Hey, hey Jason's got a cool beard. Uh, so I'm going to you know, throw him a check. Uh, that doesn't happen. Um. <laughs> yeah. And, and thing with the, the, the investors too, it's um, 
with them, like like being a startup is not easy, but I think with VC is even harder, right? Because like you might get a one, like one out of ten might be a home run, right? And that's your count on, right? You got to go through all these failures. Yeah, everyone sees the failures. Like man, you know. Yeah, you can't hide them. Everybody knows, and because it, because it, it's on page book. <laughs> yeah, like you, well, you keep yeah. on picking wrong, right? But but you don't have your success until like ten years down the road. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the things that you know those institutional investors use pitch book for is how can we vet managers? How can we see their experience either back when they were an entrepreneur, if, if they're, you know, kind of going that operator route or at their previous investment firm, what, what deals were they a part of? Were they a part of some of those home runs at a bigger firm and now they're striking out on their own? Um, and then their history as a firm themselves, what, what have they done? Have they had a couple home runs or, or did they have a pretty good batting average? Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of some of the intel we give to our clients. So Eric, if you're a lawyer, you got to go to law school. You, you try to get certified, accounts and certifications, even mechanics of certifications. Is there any anything like that for VCs, or you just say, "I'm Jason Cabinets, I'm gonna be VC." Yeah, it depends. Um, the, there are some that will come up, you know, through the through the ranks of um, the investment world, maybe investment banking into a role as an associate at a or an analyst at a private equity or venture capital firm, eventually make partner. Uh, they're like I mentioned, kind of the operator route where uh, maybe your, your startup, maybe Cavus HR strikes a big next unicorn. Um, you exit and now you're looking for something to do with all that money. So uh, go start a VC fund, join a VC fund. Um, th- th- those are kind of, I think the two primary routes people take. There's no, I mean, there's no VC university. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a standard route to it for anybody. Um, so I know a picture you probably see like there's the Seattle startup scene, Austin, Boston, all the different tech startup scenes. Yeah. What are like similarities and differences you see in all the, all, all the different scenes? Like, uh, is like, 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 is like, if you're a startup company in Seattle, you might get evaluated at two, 2 million, whereas San Francisco is 4 million, where somewhere else, like look different things. Like, is like a seed round in Seattle, really like an A round in Boston, or is it all like pretty much same? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it's kind of getting normalized after, you know, post COVID and, um, yeah, I, I think kind of the conventional wisdom has been everybody wants to be the Bay Area, um, but the Bay Area is worried about everybody else, you know, taking their good startups. So, um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, th- there is some truth to, you know, kind of a, a discount outside the, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Um, starting to see that kind of go away as, you know, I think kind of an impact of COVID where um, people can command a higher price in other areas. Um, it's more just, Hey, I, I, I think we see more of a split industry wise than we do, um, geographical at this point, but, but there is a little bit of a difference, however slight. So you talked about this summer already, but what exactly does PitchBook do? Or a better question is what does PitchBook not do? Yeah. So PitchBook, uh, we track everything in the private markets, public markets too. Like you mentioned, we're, we're, uh, we were acquired by Morningstar back in 2016. Um, they were actually in on the seed round. Um, back in the day, back in 2007, when our founder, uh, John, was out fundraising, just like you are, <laughs> um, they were in on on the seed round. And so they've been a, kind of a partner from the beginning. We're in on the A, and they acquired us uh, back in 2016. Amazing partnership. Um, they kind of still let us have our own brand, run the private market side of things. And so it's kind of like when Amazon bought it, like Zappos and Whole Foods. Amazon owns those companies. They mm-hmm. pretty much operate their own. So pretty much same, same concept. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're like a wholly owned subsidiary. We still operate under the PitchBook brand. Um, and, and what we do is any kind of financial data on the private markets. Uh, you know, we've been talking about startups, venture capital. We'll also track private equity, um, real assets. So anything like real estate, infrastructure funds, um, debt. We do a great job of tracking the, the private debt space um, and a, a variety of uses for that. I, I talk, well, That's one of the things I love about PitchBook is it's not... You know, I'm selling, uh, you know, one product to one client type. I'm selling this product that does a hundred different things. And I'll be on a call with a, an investment bank in South America in the morning and a startup in Boulder, Colorado in the afternoon. And I'll end my day with a, you know, limited partner, a pension fund in Asia. Like it, it, it's such a diverse client. I never get bored because we do, we do so much. You can do so much with our data and I, I get to work with a lot of really 
really cool people. So I know you can, I know this is part of your secret sauce, but you tell me how you get the data. Is it scrapes from somewhere or is it like a website you pull stuff, pull stuff from? Or? You're, at, you're asking the hard questions now. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we start with gathering everything that's out there publicly. So if you can find it out there, it's probably on pitch. Yeah. If we can, if we can verify it. So we've, we grab everything that's out there. We ve verify, validate. We do that with a human team. Um, we've got some cool AI machine learning processes to gather that info and we, we verify it. What separates us from other, maybe just regular data providers is that we have a human team that's picking up the phone and calling those VC investors, those investment banks, sending out quarterly surveys. So it's a, it's a very- it's like a two thong for approach, the technical approach, yeah, data script- Technical and, and, and then a human, human approach. Person. And it's incredibly human capital intensive. I think about half the people at PitchBook, maybe more than that, are our research team. Do a VC ever reach out to you? Not, not you personally, but someone on the pitch book Hey, you know, on pitch book, it says like, I have like $25 million in dry powder. Mm -hmm. Now there's no dry powder means the money they can invest in your company. That $25 million, well, actually that's incorrect. It's actually like a different number, right? Yeah, th that'll happen. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's kind of one of the, one of the feedback loops that we have to correct that information. So um, it's the private markets. It'll never be perfect. And and we, we, we accept that, but we're going to be as good as we can. And so, yeah, we'll, we take feedback from actual investors, from people that are on the platform to, uh, to correct that. And we've got some great partnerships with people that aren't clients that just say, Hey, I want to have my right info on there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we, that research team is, is always working to improve the data set every day. So is Pittsburgh more for VCs and investors or more for people raising funds? Both. Or a combination. Yeah, both. It's, I mean, it's a combo. It's, um, you know, it definitely hits the sweet spot with VC and, and PE general partner investors because, you know, those are the guys that are going to be spending all day, every day on PitchBook, um, de depending on, on their role at the firm. Um, but yeah, it is an, a super powerful tool for a startup looking to raise money because you can see, like you said, I want to see the investors that invest in HR tech mm -hmm. that have dry powder that are, you know, active in the last few years. That's a search that'll take you 35 seconds. Yeah. When you, when you do that on your own, that's going to take a couple of weeks at least maybe. And if you even know what to look at. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you might just be missing a huge portion and um, you know, f VC funds really any investor will maybe they'll say they, their thesis is one thing, but they're actually investing in something else because they're seeing, you know, an opportunity there. So PitchBook is a way to kind of check that and, and find those unique opportunities that you might not find elsewhere. Yeah, one good thing about Pittsburgh too, and 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 Eric will do his demo in, in, in a few minutes. Is like, like suppose you're raising funds, and an investor will come to you. Hey, you know, Jason, like I, I really like your company. Here's two hundred thousand dollars, thirty percent of your company. Go to Pittsburgh, two hundred percent wouldn't even. So I give, actually give you one percent of my company, right? So you yeah. can call kind of call bullshit, right? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, I would say valuations are an art and a science yeah. in in the VC world. Um, not as not as clear cut as it is on the public equity side. Um but you can see what else is out there. What is the going rate for an HR tech startup in Seattle? Um, what, what other deals have recently happened that we can use as a comp to say, and, and, and honestly, yeah, for startup founders, when, when do I just say, no, that's, yeah. that's not a deal. I'm and then in. even a deep diver, like someone's invest, interested in investing in a company, like, you know, John Brown VC from, we'll say Austin, right? Mm -hmm. You can go there and see everything he's invested in. Did that company make it, you know? And then both the invest in 10 companies, you can go, research, okay, let me reach out to these 10 star founders. Yeah. Did this guy add value besides money or, you know? Yeah. It's, it's you know, like you said, yeah. I don't want to say anybody can go out there and, 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 and find money, but there's a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of dry powder out there. How do you find somebody that's a good fit for you? You know, how do you find that smart money? That's going to be a value add on your board that has a track record of success. Um, and then the other piece of it on PitchBook is, well, who else do they invest with? Who do they co-invest on rounds with? And how do we get introductions to those people? So that's kind of the next level of, all right, I got John Brown VC, but I, I, I need to, you know, he's not going to be the only check writer on this round. I need to find five or six other investors. Well, who do I know to, you know, I need to know who to ask for introductions from him to. Yeah. And what, that's a good, I think it's a big disconnect. Like a lot of star founders, like they're trying to raise funds. They get getting full calls. They have a hard time, but according to Pittsburgh and all the resources, there's lots and lots of drop out of there. There's so much money out there. It's just the fact you got to put yourself in the, in the right position to get it and convince them to give it to you, right? Because like I said, they're just going to give it to you, right? They're like, they've, yeah. they've had to go to the struggle themselves. They had to grind for this the fund. And you know, you, you got you to gotta show them something. 
Yeah. And, and they're sitting there on pitch book looking at that valuation data too. And, and that's kind of how they're, they're bracketing those negotiations. Well, so that's one way. So having that kind of insight as a startup founder is a huge advantage to know, kind of know what, what they're going to offer. Whoa, that's way outside of what I expected. That's not somebody I want to work with. Um, or maybe there's, you know, there's always some extenuating factor that could cause that, but um, yeah, it, 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 you know, especially coming from the military, it gives you the intel you need to go on the mission. That's, that's all it is, is intel. It's intel. That's all it is, is intel. And that's, yeah, I'm, I'm talking with uh, with some of the folks at PitchBook about hiring more veterans. And I was like, we need to get some intel analysts I mean, y'all got some like the mili- research Y'all team. got some military intelligence <laughs> people in there? Yeah, we, 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 we've got some really smart people, people that would have done amazingly well as like human intelligence analysts. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity all, at PitchBook for, um, you know, I think more people on the sales team, I think there's a lot of opportunity on the research team, on the product team to, to bring on more vets. In so. Pittsburgh, you, you're like war to war, right? You, y'all, y'all deal with startups in South America, Africa, Europe, oh, yeah. everywhere. We, we've got offices in uh, Seattle, obviously, is our, is our home, our headquarters. We've got an office in San Francisco, uh, New York, London. We just opened our Hong Kong office. Um, we've got a few people that sit in Chicago as well. So it is a global organization. We track everything from startups in Africa to, you know, investors in um, Uzbekistan. It, they're on pitch, but. So next question. Um, I'm sure you, you know, a lot of startup founders raising money, some successful, mm-hmm. most not, you know, unfortunately, what are the successful ones doing right? Or what are the unsuccessful ones doing wrong? The successful ones are, are using every avenue and every tool at their disposal. And they, I don't care if it's PitchBook or not. I would love for more people, more startup founders to use PitchBook. We've got a ton that do, and they see an outsized success rate. But whatever you're doing, don't just, you know, if something's not working, don't keep doing it. I, I talk to some, they're like, yeah, I can't raise money. And you're like, okay, okay, what are you doing? Well, I'm just, you know, working with the network and nobody wants to invest in me. And it's like, well, look outside your network then. And that has a lot in Seattle too, right? Like Seattle investors are great, but a lot, you know, they don't invest in everything. I know mm-hmm. so many star founders, like they hear two or three no's from Seattle founders or Seattle Angel Conference, whatever the case may be, and they stop, right? Have you thought about going to Bay Area, like, you know, get a hotel room for a month? Have you, you know, I mean, there's so many other opportunities yeah. out there, right? And and don't be afraid to, to do cold outreach, mm-hmm. cold fundraising outreach. People, a lot of founders are scared of that and don't think it works. People only write checks to people they know if they have a warm introduction. That's not true. I talked to a lot of investors and they have had great opportunities that came across their plate because somebody sent them a pitch deck in an email. So I want to quickly give a shout out to Nick Hughes. He's a part of Founders Live. About four months ago, he put a together like Excel spreadsheet. He got with a lot of investors and it was like, I, I think it was 20 investors in there and he put it out to the community. They were like, hey, this do a calendar invite. So like I, I, I was personally able to like do calls like 20 of them. Right. And some of the investors want to do that. They want to reach out to you and hear your idea. Right. Mm-hmm. But you gotta, like, if I didn't know Nick Hughes, if I didn't go to finals live at two or three years ago, I wouldn't know Nick Hughes, you know, and the opportunity would have been there. Yeah. And I, and I think that's part of it too. You know, don't take that no as, as a door closed. That's a new connection you just made. Yep. And that's somebody else that's in the network. Um, maybe it's an opportunity um, and yeah, I, I think people that are going out there, finding an accelerator to do, finding some other way to get the name out there to, to grow that, um, that community that knows about them is it's key. And it, it's a full-time job fundraising, <laughs> As you, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you, but you still got a company to run. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and a lot of people, a lot of startup founders see value in PitchBook just for that, just like the data is amazing. It's, it's everything you're going to need, but also just the efficiency, the fact that you can do it quickly. And the thing with fundraising too, I got some great advice. I had an interview with a guy named uh, Michelle Tricot. He has a company called Airbyte out of the Bay Area. Okay. They just raised, I'm making this number up, they just raised like a $10 million B round, $20 million B round. His advice was like a lot of founders, they like spread out, they like fundraise a little bit here, a little bit here, you know, six months later, still money. He said like, you gotta fucking just suck it up and go all in for a month, right? Mm-hmm. You gotta say, you gotta have somebody else you trust, a co-founder, say, hey, you have to run the company. You as a founder, you have to be all in for three, three months, or at least a month, right? Yeah. And they said after a month, have a raise no funds, maybe, you know, go back to the drawing board. But you said you got to suck it up and just, just do it for a month. You can't draw it out. It doesn't work. Yeah. And, I mean, there are services out there that will help you raise the money or raise the money for you and some great services. And for some companies, that's a fit. A lot of the investors I talk to will say, if, yeah, if you're not doing the fundraising yourself, that, that tells me something. Yeah. I always um, heard that too. Yeah. But, I mean, there are some places where it's a great fit and that's a great service. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, don't be afraid to get out there, roll up your sleeves and, and get dirty for a couple months. And, and just like, and think of reason funds is like sales, right? You gotta we get used to hearing no all the time. Oh, it's great. I love getting sold. No, no your idea sucks. No yeah. one's going to give you money. Like, yeah. Yeah. It happens a lot. You just, I mean, and that's one of the things I think, you know, military people are great startup founders are great salespeople because whatever I got told, no, I mean, okay. Okay. Did he, did he yell did, at me? Did, 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 did I die? Did I die? Yeah. Like, who cares, yeah. man? Like, so my story was that, like, I, I was a AG officer in the army, like HR in the army, right? I, one time I had to do the briefing and this two-star general just reading my ass, right? Yeah. And it's like, if I can take that and bounce back. So I got a reaming out from the two-star general the next day, he gave me a coin because I there proved so much, right? Yeah. If I can handle that, yeah. Some, someone give me tell me, you know, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's one of the advantages you have coming out of the military. You're used to, yeah. Get, getting reamed out. Skull, getting, skull drugged. <laughs> yeah. Skull drugged in the mud. <laughs> um, yeah, going to Sears school and having them, uh, you know, hey, did I, get, did I get hit in the face? Did I get locked in a, a closet or whatever? No. Okay, cool. This wasn't yeah. that bad of a day. Um, and honestly, hey, a, a no is is valuable. A hey, lot better than it may be. And, and a lot of times no it, it'll be a no with a feedback. You know, maybe, well, hey, not not for now, Jason, but you know, I'd be really interested on your series B or C. Yeah. Keep, keep me in the Rolodex and here's a couple of people to talk to. So it, it's all about getting out there. It, it is a absolute slog at times, but like I said, the, the money's out there. Here's one for you. You hear this all the time. Like you'll hear people say, well, if you go to like, if I, if I go to an investor and they say no, but they say, well, Jason, you're not for me, but I'm a, uh, um, refer you to someone else. Mm-hmm. A lot of people say, don't do that because the second investor say, well, the first one is invest you. Why, why should I invest? Right. But then to go on the piss book, I'm like, well, maybe this first investor not invest because they have no drug powder. They have like, they can't, is that work? Yeah. Why not take a referral? But a lot of investors, they will tell you why not, not to do it. Right. I just think that's bad advice. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I'd probably agree. I, th- I think there's a, a number of reasons somebody wouldn't invest in a startup and it's not always because it's a bad idea or a bad founder team or, uh, whatever. It's just, Hey, maybe it's not a fit for the fund. Maybe they are, maybe they already have a similar uh, company in, in the fund and, you know, they don't want to invest in this strategy again. So yeah, I think there's 5 million reasons why somebody wouldn't invest. And if, if they're willing to make that introduction or tell you to pursue somebody else, that's probably a good thing. Um, so we've been talking about startups all over, all over the world. Let's focus on Seattle for a minute. Yeah. Since we're in the Seattle area. What excites you about the Seattle tech area? What like new technology is coming out? What new companies coming out? Like something like, okay, I can't wait to, this to be public. I, I'm super excited for the next 10 years in Seattle. I, I think we see so many startups that were uh, founded by, and still every day by Microsoft alumni. I'm excited for the Amazon alum. There's so many great minds that are growing at that company. And it's such a time of growth there. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff. I'm excited for those people to break out and, and some already have, there's some really great startups from Amazon alums, but I, I think just there's a going to be a great ecosystem of, of Amazon alumni founders and from the other great companies in Seattle as well. But um, kind of, I think we're at this inflection point where tech is just growing exponentially. There's more and more people getting into it and there's um, just a ton. I, me personally excited about Seattle. I'm excited for the space scene. Uh, you know, we've got, Blue Origin here, SpaceX has their All the AI, AR, VR. The, yeah, the there's next like, generation tech over in Redmond. Uh, you know, there's a lot of lot of, lot of satellite work over there. Um, some more traditional, you know, defense firms as well. Boeing, um, Aerojet, Rocket, Dyn, a lot of really great companies. But then, yeah, the Project uh, Quaper project. There's Space Flight up in uh, um, Lake Union that's doing a lot of cool stuff with their Black Sky satellites. Um, Worked recently with uh, Starfish Space, a couple of, of uh, UW uh, alums that are doing a, a really cool thing in space. They got their first launch coming up on Friday, I think. So I think there's a lot of great space tech that's going to come out in Seattle in addition to that other just general tech, general Amazon alum, Microsoft alums. But me, and I, and, and I think space is cool. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for that. I think there's a huge space scene here. And so you probably know this better than I can, but you always hear like, you're, like I know there's a lot of angel investors for like from Amazon, Microsoft, but I never heard like anyone from Starbucks being an angel investor. It's like, that'd be a good opportunity for like a lot of people from Starbucks. Being, yeah. Yeah. Them. I'm not sure if anyone specifically, um, I do know the Schultz family does a ton yeah. of work with, with vets, with the, um, 
and the name of the program is going to escape me now through Syracuse for for veterans to get their uh, uh, I am VS yeah like yeah, that. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and Starbucks also a sponsor a bunker labs too they do a, oh, we yeah. do a thing with them called bunker neck we awesome. do like once a quarter we got to get back doing that too they're yeah. sponsor bunker labs also yeah they do a lot of really good a lot of really good work for veterans so um yeah yeah I'm not sure of any specific angels okay there, can you always say like I'm an Amazon investor I have to look whatever. at pitch book yeah exactly. <laughs> All right, so next we're going to go do this demo. So first I'm going to share my screen so I can pull up the Pittsburgh website. And then me and Eric are going to have to change chairs. Uh, let me pull up my LinkedIn and make sure it comes up. So I just want to make sure that that screen shares on the, on the LinkedIn Live. They did it earlier. Of course, there's never a fast one. Isn't for a right? Of course. Okay, it's on. Okay, so me and I are going to switch chairs, and he's going to do the demo. Did you want me to try along on mine or you do yours or? Uh, yeah, why don't you slide on yours? Because the password's on my phone, my phone's over oh, here. Okay. Yeah. And plus, NYU is always a challenge anyway. So where Eric logs into our account, he's going to do a, a, a you know, sub, like a basic demo of PitchBook, show you some, some of the capabilities you have. And also for you listening, or this is live, this always also be pushed out as a podcast probably about a month. Go through some security checks here. See here the morning star login screen. So more security than the US military base, right? Hey, this is good security. Uh not gonna say my password on here. Do my SSO. All right, so we, we talked about PitchBook, database of all this private market information, public market too. We integrate all Morningstar's info onto PitchBook itself. Um, but how, you know, how startup founders, how VCs access this is through the web portal here um, called the PitchBook platform. What we're looking at is the, uh, the dashboard as we open it up here in, in the morning to do some fundraising work. Uh, you know, we'll get uh, kind of a news feed here on, you know, based on our, what we're working on the platform. So it could, PitchBook kind of learns what we're doing. We'll curate content directly towards us. Um, and, and we'll keep this somewhat high level, but we'll use the fundraising example. You know, we're here talking about entrepreneurs and, and startup founders. So, um, you know, we'll run like a company and deal search. So massive database of info. We're going to layer a number of filters onto it to, um, to find exactly what we're looking for. Maybe I want to target specific investors that have a specific uh, investor history. So I will go to this investor search actually, that'll be better. So I guess we could use your company as an example, Jason. Okay. We, we could just use any, we could make it up, but um, so yeah, you're, you're a startup founder raising money and it doesn't have to be for, for Kevin State HR, but you know, what, what industry are, are, are you looking to raise money for? Let's do a ed tech. Ed tech, Education tech. like it. So, you know, we can come here, look at what industry deals are happening in get down here to ed tech itself we've got a number of verticals a lot of cool tech ag tech ai ed tech so we'll throw ed tech on here pitch will give us recommendations maybe you know we want to throw on educational software as an industry as well um 
We could throw on keywords. We could do Boolean search logic. We can get really fancy with it, but we'll just kind of keep it general for this. So now we're looking at just the 15 and a half thousand ed tech investors. Only 15,000. Only 15,000. Pretty easy to figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's only going to take you a couple of years to get through. So what, 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 you know, what round are you raising? What kind of capital are you looking for? So here's a good question for you. Like talk about the terminology. Like mm -hmm. some people say like it's pre-seed, seed, A. Some people say round one, round two, round three. Is it, does that really matter? Yeah. I mean, people will call it different things and there's no, you know, one definition of a seed versus series A. And I think for some industries, it's different, you know, a, a space tech seed round that, you know, like we were just talking about is going to look like a series A or even maybe a series B for some of like, just because the amount of capital that that industry requires. Um, let's say like we're raising, uh, you know, maybe we want to look at like the seed and series A investors. So let's go like seed series A. Now we're, you know, we just cut that list in half. Here's 6,000 investors. Um, and maybe I want to target investors that are just doing deals in the U.S. You know, U.S. headquarter companies. So here's 3,300 investors that are doing, you know, U.S. deals. We could look where, you know, where is the investor located? Dry powder amounts, whatever. Let's look maybe, you know, maybe we want to target U.S. investors for some reason or even uh, a, a sub-region of that, but we'll just kind of look at U.S. So are you doing this? Do some investors only like only invest like of course they only invest like certain verticals, right? Maybe mm -hmm. just HR tech or ed tech, but some of them only invest like only Seattle, only Dallas, only yeah. Austin. Yeah, we we'll definitely see that. And that's usually like, you know, the firm's purpose is to promote whatever tech in Seattle or in um Texas. So it, it's usually pretty, pretty clear that that that's what it is, okay. you know. Capital factory. Uh, in in Austin isn't isn't doing a ton of deals in Seattle. So obviously you're um, trying to raise money. You might not want to reach out to someone only raise the money in a certain area, right? Because yeah. you're wasting both your time yeah. and their time. So so for this now, I mean, maybe we just want to see people doing deals in the last few years. So I'll just throw a, a date filter on there. All right, we got under a thousand. Still a pretty big list. Uh, there are some ways we can we can sort and filter this here in a second, but we'll just run this search. How long did that take us? Seconds, maybe I mean, a minute. That was most. pretty pretty easy. And now I can look. And I have this list sorted by most investments that meet our criteria. So most ed tech investments in the U.S. seed series A last three years. Here's the list. Um, you know, again, a thousand investors. Some of these guys are doing a whole lot of deals. We can, you know, really quickly see their investments against their total. How much of a percentage of their portfolio is ed tech? Um, you mentioned uh, dry powder. We can see their total AUM. That's assets under management in millions. We see their dry powder in millions as well. What, what do they have in the checkbook, in the fund, ready to deploy right now? No, it's a million dollars. That's the minimum amount. Of, like, can you see who has like $500,000 yeah. or? Yeah, okay. you can see like, um, yeah, some of these here, like social stars. Some of these accelerators will have like smaller amounts, but yeah, yeah here's one under a million. Um, so yeah, we'll, 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 we'll always track that. But maybe if it, even if it's low, maybe we can go in and see they have an open fund. Mm -hmm. So they're actively fundraising. Great time to talk to an investor as they're raising mm -hmm. a fund about to start doing deals. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, th I mean, that's a quick way to find a list of investors from here on PitchBook. You know, we would dive into the, into the investor profile itself. And now we can see all the info. This is Rethink Capital Partners. That was at the top of the list. They've got quite a bit of dry powder here. Now the rank order, there's like one, two, three, four. Does that, does that order matter? Is that any certain thing or? Yeah, go back. That's, I, I set that up custom. So okay. that, that, and that's just like a, a layout I have. Okay. Um, but that, I just have it sorted by investments that matter criteria. Cause I want to okay. find the people that are doing a lot of deals mm -hmm. in this space. Maybe I want to find people that aren't doing a lot of deals in this space, but um, you know, we can sort and filter all these columns to find what we need. Um, maybe I, I, I don't want to talk to the, the big VCs. I only want to find people that have, you know, less than a billion under management. It's really easy to go in here and play with this data. Um, and then it's the deeper dive on, I don't know about Rethink. I don't know anything about Rethink Capital Partners. Here we can see, oh, they're in White Plains. Cool. Um, they do a bunch of ed, ed tech work, looks like. We can see who's on the team, who's doing what deals. Well, at bigger firms especially, that's important. Yeah. You know, if you're looking at a Sequoia where they do everything, <laughs> who's the ed tech partner? Who's leading the ed tech deals? That's important to know so you're not reaching out to the wrong person. Um, partners. We'll have associates. So it, it's, it's really a, a good picture of the firm. We'll have their phone numbers, email, LinkedIn, allowing you to get in touch with them. Um, see what board seats they're on. If you, 
important if you want to know how they are as a, a board partner as it. Yeah. <laughs> Might hey, be I'm, important. I'm going to reach out to, uh, you know, one of these companies and see, Hey, how, how is this person on the board? Cause that's important to know. Um, again, lead partners on the deals. I mean, we, we could go in super in depth here. Is it, he has like phone numbers, emails. Yeah. We've got, yeah. Contact information. LinkedIn. And, and, and PitchBook is, we have a team that tests that, that to yeah. make sure it's accurate. Um, and then here, you know, this is kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the investor profile. Here's the deals they're doing. Here's one from a couple of days ago that they just did. And here's the 12 co-investors on that round. So, um, how, how do they exit companies? You know, is it a lot of M&A looks like for this firm? A couple lot of businesses. That's, that's pretty typical, but, um, you know, are, are they having a lot go out of business and just one or two home runs or do they have a pretty good track record of helping build companies? Um, and the other people, yeah, the other, the other part of it, who else do they work with? How do we find more, comp- more investors like Rethink? Because maybe um, you talk to the partner X at Rethink Capital and they're like, hey, I love it. We're in, find, find you know, find more investors though. Let me know what you need. And of course you're gonna say, well, yeah, just send my deck to everybody you know. <laughs> no, hey, send my deck to the partners at, you know, to this, this partner at Reach, yeah. at Salesforce Ventures, at Strata. And that's, I mean, you're saving them time. They're going to love that. Yeah, and they know you've done the research. And they know you know what you're talking about. It just helps build your brand as a founder. Um, of course, we could go further in, in depth on on all this data on on the investor. That's kind of the main parts for founders, though. Um, and then the other piece of it is going to be, you know, like, like you mentioned, the valuation side mm-hmm. of it. So we can also see what, like what other deals are happening in the space. Um, you know, here's some, some really recent deals. Let's go here. We can look at like the actual financial data of these deals. So things like the deal size, again, in, this is in millions. What equity is acquired by the investors? That's pretty important. Um, pre and post money valuations. So yeah, what other checks are out there? What comps are, are going on? What are the big deals I need to know about as a founder as well, as, mm-hmm. as you're building that pitch deck, as you're talking to investors. Um, and then we can even distill that down into um, a pivot table. We could bring it into Excel to work with the data there. There's an Excel plugin. Um, but here, all right, what are the year over year trends at the different fundraising points? You know, cap invested, pre-money, post-money, percent acquired. So yeah, if I'm an ed tech company raising a seed right now, they're looking, you know, the median is three and a half million at a 9 million pre 12 Point two posts. And these all and, numbers, terminology of founder, you need to be spot yeah. on with, right? And and you and you can expect to give up about thirty percent of your company for that three and a half million. That that's what the going rate for an ed tech startup is right now. Of course, with this, we could then split that into geographies. We could look mm-hmm. at Bay Area versus Seattle versus you know what have you. A, a, a lot we could do with it, mm-hmm. but yeah, this is giving you the intel you need to negotiate with investors. Now. Can you show how this will work from the VC side? Like, what do you show the VC? How does the VC research startup mm-hmm. companies on here? Yeah, so the valuation side of this is pretty similar. Yeah, what, what are the last last few years of deals in, in this space I'm interested in investing in? Um, we might look at like a sourcing search. So, and and, and I'm happy if, if any of the listeners are interested to kind of customize this for them on a, on a one-on-one call. But um, yeah, maybe we want to build a similar search. I want to find... People that raise a seed in, we can pick something else. Maybe just IT in general. They raise an IT seed, but they haven't raised something in a minute. Like we kind of know the burn rates, the median time between rounds. You're looking to raise a Series A, you know, 12 to 14 months after your seed. Depends a little bit on on industry, but so I'm going to say I want to look. You know, people that haven't raised money in about a year are in the U.S. This is still a pretty big list. So maybe I want to cut this down even more. And I want to find, uh, maybe we'll look something more specific than IT. Um, grab like SaaS or something. All right, whatever, it doesn't matter, SaaS. All right, so th- this would be like a sourcing search. I'm a Series A investor. I want to know who's out there in the seed world. They raise seed money. They're about to raise another round because you know you got to know about it before it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'd run this search and say, okay, here, here are the people, if I'm a venture associate, venture analyst, and I'm trying to make, try to make a name for myself. I want to find the next hot thing, the next hot thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm operating within the, the thesis of my firm. 
I know what the partners are going to like, but here are the people I'm interested in. Here's the list of those that raise a seed, haven't raised money in about a year. Probably out looking for you're doing, you're doing research. Round. This company doing well. They're doing bad. Yeah, yeah. Are they doing business? Yep. And and now I'm coming in to look at, you know, some of the deeper deal. You know, software tools. Okay, yeah. Remote work culture. Whatever. Remote work is over. We're going back to the office. It's not really true. Um, so uh, yeah, I can see what those seed deals were here. Similar to that last screen. And like, like vice versa, like, like founders do their research. This analyst can know, oh, yeah. do the research too. They can reach out to those seed investors. Hey, you know, what is this, what, how does this company act to you? Yeah. Were, were they coachable? Were they cooperative? Mm-hmm. Did they, you know, listen to lessons learned? Yeah. Who else is on, on that capital? Are you, are you going to reinvest, you know? Yeah. And so now we can come here and look at like the deal history. We can see, you know, here's that most recent round. Um, here's the cap table. Get into... All right, what happened on this round? Who who was in on the deal? Who do we need to talk to to see what this is all about? And maybe and maybe get in. Um, so yeah, it just gives them the whole picture of the company. Not the whole picture, but at least enough to do that initial diligence. Now, okay, Excel, that's somebody I want to talk to. Let's 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 reach out to them. All right. Well, I'm, all right, who's the CEO? Brandon. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot Brandon an email. I'm gonna hit him up on LinkedIn and, and say, hey, let's talk. We might be interested in, in an investment. So but we'll see VCs use it like that. Same thing on the private equity side, a little bit different on how you would build it out, but um, yeah. And then PitchBook can see, you know, all about the company, even, even on like the IP side, like what patents does this company have? Here's all that. Okay. They got some good IP. I'm, I'm interested in investing. Um, so. So yeah. putting your, your sales hat on, why should a VC use PitchBook? Efficiency and accuracy. VCs are looking at, hundreds of deals. I mean, they're looking at so many deals, but it's limited by the throughput of their team. Um, it's how, you know, do, are you going to miss that next unicorn because you were bogged down looking at something else? Um, and then and it's the fundraising side too. Cause again, they're still yeah, fundraising. The next question was, why should a star founder use PitchBook? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so for the, for the VCs, it's, Hey, who's committing to these other VC funds? Cause I, all right, we just raised fund one. We're thinking about the next fund. Just how, just like a startup. Hey, we just closed the seed. Mm-hmm. When's the best time to start fundraising for the series A? Now. Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the same. And then the other thing is, you know, PitchBook has a team of analysts. We, we put out research. So we like this year, all right, AI machine learning, vertical applications. What's that all about? We've got an analyst that covers it. We've got long form research, hundreds of pages of research. We've got one-on-one calls with those analysts. Hey, what's hot in the space? Who should we be looking at? Who should we be talking to? Um, so it's it's just a very immersive experience of data in the space. It's a, an amazing way to make yourself. Obviously, if you're working at a VC, you're pretty smart, but it's a very efficient well, way. Well, hopefully anyway, right? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, probably most are. Um, but yeah, it, it's just an incredibly efficient way to stay on top of the game. And then on the founder side, I mean, a lot of the same things. If you got a full-time job, you are running, you're building a company. I mean, do a Boolean search. It has all this information with a matter of, we'll say, the worst case scenario, two minutes, or call 10,000 investors. And, yeah. hey, I'm Jason Kavnis, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, hey, Jason, dude, I do a late stage uh, B, B2C investing, and you're a B2B company, not interested. Yeah. Well, you could have known that. Uh, you would have saved yourself five hours looking up information on that investor that could have been spent building your product or looking up somebody else. So, um, yeah. And, and that's, and that's what pitch was all about. How can we help our clients win? How can we give, you know, set them up for success, give them more time back to, to build their company. Um, yeah, it, I mean, that, that's what it is for me. How can I help my clients win? How can I give them an outsized advantage that's going to let them raise this money, raise more money? protect their valuation so that when they exit, they've got more money in the, in, in the bank. You know, they've got more equity that they still own that they can give to their employees. And, and equity is golden, right? You don't want to give too much away too soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and, and honestly, that's what I love about this job is I get to help people win. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 it's awesome. It's the same stuff I did in the military. I helped people win. I helped put people on objectives and I helped pick them up and help them get the mission done. I do the same thing now. It's just a little different. You know, I just don't, I just don't put on a camouflage <laughs> uniform and 
spin up two, you know, T seven hundred one jet engines, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's just as exciting. So, anything else you want to cover, cover in the demo before we switch, switch seats? Uh, nope, we can we can stop okay. that out. We'll switch back. Um, again, I'll 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 say you know, hey, anybody that's listening, um, ha- happy to dive deeper on on anything you're working on within PitchBook. There's a ton. I you know, we're we're talking a lot about startups, VCs, just kind of like that's what Jay Stein likes to talk about. Um, but I work with anybody from, uh, real estate, I, you know, real estate companies looking to source startups that are growing and need more office space to, I didn't think about that. That's a great oh yeah. point. Oh yeah. Um, recruiting firms. Who, and that's, that's the word point. Like, Hey, this company just raised a round. I draw they need office space. Let me go. Yeah. And the same thing. Hey, they just raised a series a, we know. Series A, Series B, that's typically when people are starting to grow those teams, grow that sales function, mm-hmm. grow the the dev team. It's not just two guys in a garage, um, you know, or it's not just uh, a couple of founders hanging out yeah. here at, at Bunker Lab Seattle with Jason learning, you know, building out the product. Yeah. It's a growing company. They need to hire. So we'll have I mean, recruiting firms. Having that, HR, I definitely plan to take advantage, right? If my company makes it, you know, use PitchBook. These companies yeah. for this A round, they probably need HR. Let me reach yeah. out to them, right? I mean, if <laughs> I say that, there's nobody in in the business world that, that couldn't find a use for PitchBook. Um, yeah, maybe it's it, Cavus HR just raised a bunch of money, maybe a little bit later later stage. We're gonna do some acquisitions. Mm-hmm. We can do that too. Um, help you find an investment bank, help you plan the exit strategy. What are what are companies doing down the road? What's the public um the public comps? down the road, five, seven, 10 years. Um, because that's important stuff too, the, the deep strategy. So yeah, I, I haven't found somebody yet that hasn't looked at pitch, but been like, okay, I could see how I could use this. Now, is it a fit for everybody? No. I mean, it's, um, it's a, uh, you know, it's not going to be a fit for everyone's processes and systems, but, um, I think it's, I personally, in my own biased opinion, it's one of the most game changing solutions out there. So the startups that do do use PitchBook, they usually come on like I think the A round, C round. Like when you see pit startups use like like purchasing PitchBook. Yeah, it's it's usually kind of that pre seed, pre Series A. Mm-hmm. We'll we'll bring a startup on, or it's either kind of in that bucket, or it's maybe a a later stage round, and they're looking to do some acquisitions now, mm-hmm. or they're looking to raise a bunch of money. And hey, we've got a great, you know, a great group of investors, but we need to grow that. We need to know who else is out there. Um, and we're, and we're looking to do some acquisitions. So ton of, ton of value throughout the life cycle of a startup. Um, yeah. So Eric, thanks for the great demo. I understand you have something for our listeners. Something for the listeners. Yeah. The, the, the call or something. Or oh yeah. Yeah. Kind of what, what I just talked yeah. about where, um, yeah. Ha- happy to take time. Anybody out there listening? Um, best way to get in touch with me is either email or, or LinkedIn. So my email is just uh, eric, E-R-I-C dot Murphy at pitchbook.com or on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jason will, will tag me in this, but it's, you know, my, my LinkedIn URL is just Eric J Murphy 06. Um, feel free to connect with me. Uh, if you have any questions on PitchBook, on fundraising, on how to source new hires for your company, cause you're growing, like th- there's so many things we can do. H- happy to grab time with anybody listening and, um, you know, and, and see if there's anything I can, can help you with. And then the other side of the coin also, Hey, if you're, if you're a veteran transitioning, trying to get into tech, trying to get into sales, drop me a line. Um, happy to, to grab some time, talk. Uh, there's people way smarter than me that I can hopefully hook you up with, but I at least have, have, I guess, done this thing recently, <laughs> somewhat recently. So Eric is linked to your main social media. You have other social media that you use. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's my main social media uh, on the, on the professional side. If you want to see, you know, pictures of my kids, uh, <laughs> I've got an Instagram, but, <laughs> but, but that's about it. Um, or, or views from my, my, my new house over in Bremerton. <laughs> and, and for the listeners, we're going to have the links to the, to um, Eric's social media and his gift and his, and his uh, consulting stuff and, and all that kind of stuff in the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetsatalblog.com. Also a reminder to sign up the Kevin's HR wait list. If you have a company of four, none or fewer people, we'll do HR for free for a few months while you, while you help us with the beta testing. Also, at Bunker Labs, we're going to do our first in-person event here in Seattle on July 8th. We're going to have um, 
It's going to be July 8th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the 1201 3rd Avenue Reward. We're going to have 10 great veteran companies pitch for two minutes. We have like different companies coming at this all the, all the, all the spectrum from tech companies to someone being on a tent tarp, just different companies, great, great ideas. We're also doing an entrepreneurial panel. The discussion will be what is the future of entrepreneurship in Seattle? We're going to have um, Andrew Klein, CEO of Zero Accounting. He does uh, accounting for startups in Seattle and across the nation. Bernard Edwards, another panel speaker. He does uh, marketing and branding for, for, for Fortune 500 companies and Randa McCurr. Randa has her own startup called Residence AI. She's also an angel investor and she's a, a member of the board director for WTIA here in Seattle. So be sure to sign up for that. And uh, if you go to my LinkedIn or just reach out to me, I send you, send you a link to sign up for that. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll definitely be here for that. I'm super excited for that event. Thanks, this is gonna be great. Uh, Eric, we're coming into our talk. Can you give us any advice and wisdom or anything you wanna cover? Yeah, I mean, I, I think kind of the common thread here, both on the on the veteran transition side, and the you know tech side, startup raising money is is, is use all the tools available to your disposal. Um, don't be afraid to reach out, seek mentorship. Um, don't be afraid to hear no. I think the startup founders know that. Uh, the the veterans will will learn that, and they'll learn it's not that big of a deal because they've had worse. Um, yeah, man. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there in transition when you're fundraising. Um, don't be afraid to have any, any conversation you have is a win, no matter what the outcome is. So, um, yeah, I mean, we I, I took a, a somewhat warm introduction from our, our friend Bernard, and here we are having a podcast now, and this is super cool. So uh, I, I think I said I, I, I knew I would make it in the tech world once I got on a podcast. So <laughs> here we are. So uh, <laughs> it's official. Yeah, and shout out to Bernard Mendez, too. Yeah. Yeah. Love, love Bernard. Really cool. What, what they're doing at retinas. Um, pretty excited for, for some of the work they're doing for our, our military and first responders. Definitely. Eric, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks Jason. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.